uh, sorry. Um, yeah. So both of these uh, can be uh, ischemic, arterial or venous. And then there's also hemorrhagic strokes, of which intracerebral hemorrhage and subarachnoid are the two uh, main uh, types. So uh, majority of strokes are uh, ischemic and are usually arterial ischemic. Uh, are you people are uh, 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 looking the slides? Can you guys see the slides or no? I, I... Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, okay. If there is a message, so, uh, one people cannot, we are not seeing these slides. Okay. No, it's All okay. right. So uh, if you see um, the first top images, these are CT images. And the first image is not really signs of a stroke. Uh, but the second image, there is some signs. You can see this uh, border here. This is an arterial type border where there's middle and posterior circulation arteries, which are affected here. And this is an area of infarct. This is a diffusion images and diffusion is very sensitive for early stroke. So CT may not be sensitive for early stroke, but MRI is very sensitive. So these are MRI diffusion images, and this is where you see bright diffusion images. These are signs of stroke. So these are different strokes. Penumbra, these are small strokes or large vessel stroke, which you can see here, different examples of different types of strokes. So uh, what happens in that uh, zone of stroke? So there's, there's different zones versus the penumbra. And the penumbra is the area of reversible ischemia. So there's some ischemia which you can reverse, meaning that that brain, which is ischemic at that point, can uh, come back and you can actually regain function. And penumbras can be damaged by different conditions. This is what we try to treat uh, during uh, a stroke. So uh, if a patient has fever during a stroke, it's very important you treat that fever. If patients have seizures, it's very important you treat the seizure. If they're hyperglycemic, if their sugars are too high, it's also important you treat that uh, sugar because the more uh, of these kind of conditions that happen, the larger the penumbra will be and the larger the infarct core will then become the, or the area of completed stroke. So again, uh, talking about penumbras and talking about infarcts, it's all based, based on blood flow mechanisms. And we, uh, we have a uh, kind of chart for blood flow. We talk about milliliters of blood per 100 grams of uh, brain tissue in a single minute. So when uh, the brain tissue starts to drop below 50 uh, mLs of blood per 100 grams, you start to get into the hyperperfusion state. Now you can have an ischemic state and then an ischemic state. Ischemic which means less blood, but ischemic means true loss of blood uh, and loss of function. And once you start to get below 20 uh, milliliters of blood per 100 grams of tissue, you start to get into ischemia and you have a penumbra area and then the infarct. Infarct is even when it's severely, uh, severely uh, slow blood flow or less blood flow, less than 10 mLs of blood per 100 grams of brain tissue. And that's when you start to have neuronal cell death. Now, as the time increases, the amount of infarct, infarcted tissue will also increase. So that's why we said time is brain. The faster you can get to the stroke, as you can see within, if you can get within the first hour, you have the highest rate of preservation of uh, the penumbra. Once you start getting into longer and longer hours, the amount of infarcted tissue increases and the amount of neuronal function that you can actually preserve or reverse uh, becomes less and less. Now, uh, let's talk about the causes of ischemic stroke. So the majority of uh, causes are usually cardiac. Cardiac is probably the biggest cause of stroke and you have different uh, types of uh, disease process, fibrillation, arterial fibrillation. People probably have heard of uh, different thrombi from the ventricular, uh, valvular disease, of course. Um, you can have atherosclerosis, that's 20% extracranial or intracranial large vessel. This is. There's also small vessel disease. So small vessel disease is also atherosclerosis, but also lipohyalinosis. Um, this is also when small little vessels uh, can become damaged and also can cause ischemic stroke. Other causes which are less common, of course, arterial dissection, uh, hypercoagulability states, uh, vasculitis, um, drug abuse and stroke, and then there's cryptogenic stroke. Now, cryptogenic stroke, we think is actually um, clots that form in the venous system, but because there's some kind of underlying um, hidden shunt uh, in the heart, uh, right to left shunt, sometimes some of those venous clots will go to the arterial system and then cause a stroke, and we call that cryptogenic stroke. Now, you may have heard also with uh, recently with the uh, vaccines, uh, some of the vaccines we think uh, there's uh, some studies that show, especially the mRNA vaccines, that there may be a higher risk of hypercoagulability uh, with those vaccines, especially with the spike protein, both uh, with the vaccines and even with COVID itself, we've seen increased levels of stroke. So now if you look at the bottom of the screen, there's about 700, this is a US data. So about 700 strokes annually, 
uh, 80 to 85% are ischemic. Mortality, as you can see, can be up to 12% within 30 days, and there's a high cost. And you often get recurrences uh, of stroke also. So what was the street treatment? Well, the FDA approved stroke treatment is intra, uh, our, our intravenous uh, TPA, which is tissue plasmid activator, which is a anticoagulant, which is usually given within uh, three hours of stroke. And then of course, intraarterially, this can also be given within six hours, usually in the MCA territory uh, as seen on angiography. These are the FDA approved uh, treatments. Now, uh, this was the big trial which uh, allowed approval of TPA for acute ischemic stroke. Uh, I was a student when this trial was going on in the US and we were at one of the centers where um, we were uh, participants of this trial. This involved a certain um, dosage, 0 0.9 milligrams, kilograms of TPA given within three hours. We would first give a 10% bolus up front and then 90% bolus over one hour. Um, this showed the number of patients that were treated and the odds ratio showed some kind of improvement. Um, this was the big problem with this trial that there is an intracranial hemorrhagic rate. So some patients will get hemorrhage um, uh, or conversion of the stroke into a hemorrhagic stroke. And this was a high percentage, about 6.4% um, compared to placebo. And mortality was, there was a small difference in mortality. And this is the main reason that this intravenous stroke treatment became um, uh, FDA approved because there was a difference, uh, actual difference in mortality rates uh, compared to placebo. Now, the problem with IVTPA is that one, the number of patients getting IVTPA uh, because of the uh, different reasons is very, very low. So probably the biggest reason is patients don't present in time. As you can see, those presenting less than three hours is less than 18%. So those patients are the ones who uh, initially present to an emergency room. Then the ones of those less than half will actually be eligible for the TPA. It means there are certain conditions. They have to not have recent surgery. They have to have certain other conditions going on, no other anticoagulants on board. Then they can be eligible for IV TPA. And then, of course, even less than 40%, again, those receiving TPA. So the number of patients that would actually get intravenous TPA, this was a problem. So IV TPA, while it was available, uh, not enough of the stroke patients were actually getting the IV TPA uh, due to certain conditions. Now, um, these are some of the analyses uh, regarding TPA, and it was not, as we said, it was not a, a real uh, big breakthrough. There was still uh, intracranial hemorrhage was still a problem. Um, there was still large numbers needed to treat. So you needed, needed to treat numbers needed to treat eight patients before you would see an actual benefit. And the improvement was not uh, really ideal uh, for these stroke patients. So what I would tell you is the, the take home message is that IV TPA works very good for very, very small vessel strokes. So for tiny, tiny clots that are in the brain vessels, uh, their IV TPA works well. Um, depending on the site of occlusion, we also uh, we could tell where the clot was. So if it was in the distal middle cerebral artery, there was a 44% uh, chance of improvement. Proximal MCA would be 30%. As you got into larger and larger vessels, the chance of uh, improvement was lower. Um, if you got into multiple vessels, again, the chance of improvement was lower and a large vessel basilar posterior circulation was also not as good. So this is, again, distal MCA means a small, small clot. So that's where IVTPA, and you may have, some of you may know, one of our, a few of our Pakistani uh, collaborators were in this big study. Dr. Ashfaq Shweb is probably one of the more well-known uh, Pakistani stroke neurologists uh, in the world. So continuing on again, so what we saw was when they were MCA stroke, especially MCA distal, MCA M2 is a more distal vessel, you would get better results with IV TPA. But anything where there was a large clot, the chances of improvement was lower. Again, this is more talking about uh, the rates with uh, small vessels. And again, the point is that small vessels, 92% or 75%, these are small vessel strokes. Small vessel strokes, IV TPA, not a bad uh, treatment. Anything large vessel, not great. Um, again, the same stroke kind of studies show the same thing, even uh, less. Now, what we saw here was interesting that IV TPA was good, but if you use intraarterial TPA, that was a little bit better. And if you use mechanical means to remove the clot, the recanalization rate was even better. And there was less mortality in the patients that were able to get open. Recanalization meaning you were able to get the blocked artery open, the one that was blocked from clot. Once you recanalized it, you did have a lower mortality rate for patients. And again, um, combined treatment or what we call IV, IVA, uh, IVIA treatment 
also showed better perfusion, better recanalization, and patients would do somewhat better. So then we tried using different medications for intravenous. So I'm so thinking maybe it's not the TPA, maybe it's the medication. So we tried Desmoplase or Ancrod is actually a snake venom uh, uh, derivative, Retoplase, uh, Ephibitide, Microplasmin, different things. But again, the problem with all these thrombolytics, there was still a high rate of intracranial hemorrhage and um, it did not seem to help. Uh, the other thing we use is imaging, uh, CT and MRI imaging sometimes would help us to determine when uh, the stroke could be treated. Could we treat uh, earlier than uh, or later than three hours? Um, and were there some areas of penumbra that were still possibly uh, available for treatment? And then the endovascular treatments, of course, thrombectomy was one, Dis clot disruption we'll talk about, augmented fibrosis entrapment and augmented provision we'll talk about. And then there were some neuroprotective agents which did not um, in trials uh, show that much benefit. So intra-arterial treatment. So now let's talk about putting actually thrombus in the arteries. This is of course revolving, uh, you have to have access to the femoral artery or usually cervical artery, but usually femoral artery was the most common access. Occasionally we would uh, use the carotid artery directly, but that's less common. Again, you would try to increase the concentration of medicine delivered directly to the clot. So not so much of a systemic effect, uh, disruption of the clot, and then use the imaging and collateral patterns. You could actually determine um, how and when to use and where to use the intraarterial therapy. This problems with this intraarterial therapy is one is catheter manipulation increases risk of hemorrhage. You do have to do systemic heparization, again, also increasing the risk of hemorrhage. Sometimes there was delay in initiation of thrombolysis, and you need to have uh, both skilled facilities and skilled operators to do this. Now, the problem with intraarterial is that you can have catastrophic hemorrhage if the patient does have hemorrhage, because now you put clot. Um, you put an anticoagulant directly into the brain tissue uh, via the arteries. And those arteries are under arterial pressure so they can bleed. Now, these are the arteries most often in the anterior circulation where you could treat. These are the, this is the M2 branches, M3 and M4 branches of the middle cerebral artery. M1 is considered these branches here. And then these are some of the smaller branches where we have small arteries. These are all one of the ones that can affect speech where you see a patient who gets stroke and they may have speech deficits or even some motor deficits. So this is your internal capsule caudate nucleus can be affected. And these are again, small vessels. So sometimes these small vessels will get clot. And this is where TPA works uh, very well. This is the anterior cerebral artery and here, A1 segment and then A2 segment and A3s and A4s here. And this is of course your internal carotid artery. So the big trials, some of the big trials, these were combination trials with intraarterial uh, therapy and IV heparin, where uh, patients had a high stroke score and they were able to get treatment within six hours. Again, the problem here at the end of the trial was while there was recanalization that was higher, the problem was there was a high hemorrhage rate still and there was no difference in mortality. So the end result, this trial did not appear to save people's lives. This was tried with different um, mechanisms and different uh, areas. And again, while recanalization was noted, again, the problem was mortality. Uh, the therapeutic window, again, was also sometimes an issue, depending on when patients would get treated. We also tried urokinase. Uh, and again, the same problem was while there was good recanalization, outcomes were not always good. And sometimes patients would also die or have hemorrhage. So 10% uh, dead and 7% with hemorrhage and 22% with poor outcomes. So even intraarterial therapy did not seem to be working uh, the best. This was the bridging trial where we tried IV first and then intraarterial. So IV a 10% bolus, and then the rest was given intraarterially. Again, the problem was hemorrhage. Hemorrhage was higher. If you remember the NINS trial, we talked about 6%. This was an 11% hemorrhage rate. So the problem with intraarterial therapy using uh, intraarterial anticoagulant is that still there is a high rate of hemorrhage. And because uh, in stroke, the vessels become weak, uh, there is a chance that the uh, anticoagulant can leak out and then cause hemorrhage. So again, uh, the bridging trial showed uh, kind of the same results. And again, while there were um, some, some good results, there were still a high hemorrhage rates. Uh, so again, no change in mortality. This was the other problem again, no change in mortality. So again, while therapies were good at opening up the arteries, 69% recanalization, we were still not saving people's patients' lives. So, um, and this is another trial which showed the kind of the same thing. And again, even fatal hemorrhage is 25%. So again, a high risk with intraarterial uh, uh, anticoagulant therapy. Now, this is the important takeaway from intraarterial therapy. We know that, or intravenous therapy, intravenous therapy is ineffective if the clot is greater than six millimeters. So if a clot size 
is greater than six millimeters, IVTPA has no effect. So that's one reason to image patients. If you see an image of patient and you see that uh, on the uh, CT angio, there is a clot size bigger than six millimeters, giving IVTPA at this point is not effective. And the only uh, effective route is gonna be intraarterial. Now, this is, there's anterior circulation and posterior circulation. Posterior circulation refers to your, so, you know, you, in the anterior circulation, you have your two internal carotid arteries, which become your um, anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, and posterior cerebral artery. In the posterior circulation, you have your vertebral arteries, and your vertebral arteries then become your cerebellar arteries uh, and uh, supply the uh, brain, brain stem. And that's why when these patients, when they get a vertebral stroke, or what we call a posterior circulation stroke, uh, it's a very grim, grim prognosis. About 75 to 95, 96% of patients will actually die. So there's no effective therapy for a posterior circulation stroke. Uh, heparin can be used, but again, uh, the chance of benefit is very low. Sometimes we do these patients even after 24 hours. So this is one of those rare strokes where we could treat even late because the chance of, if you don't treat, they're going to die for sure. So sometimes posterior circulation, I've had patients where we've even treated up to 48 hours after the stroke uh, actually occurred, but that's only in posterior circulation strokes. Patients will often present with coma or with a locked-in syndrome. So again, mortality rates for vertebral basilar strokes, the posterior circulation is very high, up to 75% in some studies. Recanalization can be done. Hemorrhage rates are a little bit lower than anterior circulation, but rethrombosis rates is high. This is one of the problems that they, even though you open up the vessels, they, they clot again. And again, mortality, even with recanalization, is still unfortunately high. And I start, you start to get a coma, quadriparesis, so uh, total, um, uh, total loss of all four limbs, of course, and rethrombosis and recanalization are the problems with vertebral basilar strokes. So um, endovascular strokes, this is, this is the kind of problems we see that when, you get, uh, when you're treating a stroke, especially vertebral basilar stroke, when you get hemorrhage, and this is a hemorrhage here, this is during treatment hemorrhage we can see, you get the, the ventricles are filled with blood. This patient unfortunately bled, had severe cerebral edema, and then they die. So uh, this is the problem with treating some of these strokes. Sometimes if you're too uh, uh, aggressive with the intraarterial therapy, you get hemorrhage and you get edema, and then you get a high mortality rate. So of course, we talked about the cost. Again, the cost of stroke is uh, very high in the billions, uh, both uh, in the US and all throughout the world. Um, in Pakistan, again, uh, stroke is probably the number three killer. Number one is heart disease, number two is cancer, and number three is stroke. Now, so endovascular therapies, um, you try to get uh, agents directly intraarterial. The typical window can be exchanged. But again, the problem was that there's high mortality rates and of course, high complication rates. So then mechanical thrombolysis was tried, where we actually tried to use mechanical means to fragment the clot. So to break up the clot and then allow access to the um, either intravenous or intraarterial agents. Um, and we started doing this as a combination therapy. And uh, clot fragmentation, some of the problems with clot fragmentation is that you could cause distal emboli. So while you may break up the clot, um, some of the clot may break and go more distal and be harder to treat. You can also cause trauma to the vasculature. So mechanical thrombolysis had some advantages and also some disadvantages. The initial um, uh, treatments we tried, there was a Mercy device, we tried balloons, we tried different balloons, and we tried combination balloons and um, uh, different agents. You can see this is with urokinase and a balloon, and there were some benefits. This was some of the earlier devices, the earlier devices. So these look like uh, coils, uh, as you can see, and they would engage the clot. Um, there were also ways to try to engage the clot with uh, alligator forceps types devices, uh, different nets, and even brushed up devices. Um, these were the initial uh, kind of phase or, uh, you know, um, first generation uh, treatments. Second generation, we tried aspiration. So using specific aspiration type uh, devices where you would suck up the clot uh, into a vacuum type device. And there was an NGOJET and uh, penumbra devices. Um, sometimes you try to use different catheters or cost disruption using balloons or snares. And then there was even augmented fibrinolysis using ultrasound. Um, so eventually what happened is we found that stents were probably the best. And eventually there was a stent, which was a fully retrievable stent before some of the stents, when you open the stent, the stent would be in the vessel. You could not take it back. 
some of the stents were retrievable. You could open the stent partially and then pull it back into the sheath and take it outside of the body once again. And that's when we discovered that you could do temporary bypass or thrombectomy. You could actually, with the stent inside the clot, Dr. The Dr. Clot Smith, the can you, yes. can you, can you uh, speak a little slow because uh, people's topic is very interesting and uh, people are requesting uh, to, uh, okay, thank you so much. Yes, sure, sure, sure. So, Again, stents and putting stents directly into the clot was discovered to be beneficial. You would be basically doing a temporary bypass of the clot. By putting the stent directly inside the clot, you would engage the stent and you would open the stent and then you would have a bypass mechanism whereby blood was able to flow past the clot. And this is the kind of patient you can see. Now, this is um, sometimes this is what a clot looks like. And you can see that the MC here the, is the anterior circulation, anterior cerebral artery, and the middle cerebral artery is completely blocked. Um, this is the internal carotid artery here. And so this was the first types of um, mechanical thrombectomy we do. We would take a wire and loop the wire, make a loop in the wire, and then we would push the wire through the clot and eventually try to get some of the thrombolytic agent in there and eventually open up the vessels. And this was with a combination of loop, so mechanical plus intraarterial thrombolysis. Some of the snares we tried, the snares would work for large clots, especially in the posterior circulation. But again, snare is a, a large device and can cause damage to the vessels. Um, angioplasty sometimes would work in certain clots. You would try to take a balloon and open, and with the balloon, you'd get the balloon inside the clot area. This is the this is the vertebral artery, the left vertebral artery coming in, and you can see the basilar artery is started right here, but it's completely clotted off. And here we got a balloon into the vertebral artery, into the basilar artery here, inflated the balloon, and then we started to get some flow uh, again once the thrombolytic agent was exposed to some of the clot and there was active flow. And again, you see a little bit of a loop technique with our wire here. And this is with PTA and then using TPA, and you can see a good result. But again, this, the problem with, with these kind of patients was always uh, intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, some people tried to use an ultrasound guided wire where there was an ultrasound element at the tip of the wire. And then you would connect that ultrasound element and try to uh, create um, waves of flow through the clot. So this is the clot fibrin stranding. And by putting the ultrasound, you would actually create some open holes and then the intraarterial um, uh, thrombolytic agent could be more exposed to the fibrin and break up uh, the fibrin clot. There was some um, initial successes, but again, it was a hard device uh, to manipulate into the vessels. It was a very stiff device, and to get it distal was always often very difficult. Um, but this was the acoustic streaming episode, uh, technique, but it really did not work well. Um, then in 2004, the FDA cleared certain mechanical devices for clot removal. The first was the Mercy devices. They had different versions, X5, L5, um, which would go and engage the clot. And then using a combination of uh, this engagement of the clot, then you would pull the clot out of the brain. Then there were different um, suction devices. And the biggest one that worked and continues to work is called the penumbra device. And there again, you would engage the clot and try to suck up the clot. And the penumbra trial was actually very good. It showed um, good revascularization rate, 81% revascularization rate, um, not a lot of uh, complications uh, from it. Still, the intracranial hemorrhage rate was a little bit high. Um, and then, of course, they did get some benefit, uh, and there was a difference in mortality also. Uh, for these patients. So the suction thrombectomy also seemed to be working. Um, stenting, that's when the, some of the models showed that there was good uh, results with stenting vessels during acute stroke. And this is something we still do sometimes, that if there is an acute stroke and there's a large clot, we will sometimes put a stent in and open the vessel up. And these are some of the stents. There's different kinds of stents, balloon expandable stents or self-expanding stents. And uh, now most of the stents we use are uh, what we call self-expanding stents and not balloonable. Balloon expanding would cause a little bit more damage to the vessel. So this was a reason not to use them as frequently. Here's a typical patient, 76 year old, um, uh, right-handed male with a past medical history of hypertension, coronary artery disease, diabetes, typical kind of uh, stroke patient. And as you can see, there's a very tight stenosis and then there's clot in the distal circulation. So one, you get a balloon in, you kind of open this stent, put a stent here, this is a drug eluting stent. And then once you have the stent open, then there's flow and there's still thrombolytic slowing, the, eventually the flow will open. Uh, so this was with a cipher stent. Um, there are some people who tried to put some balloons in the arterial vessels in the aorta specifically to increase 
blow to the brain. Um, these devices also did not really seem to help, even though they were increasing flow to the brain, um, they did not appear to uh, decrease the amount of uh, infarcted tissue or affect mortality. Um, so this was the coaxial device where there was a uh, balloon occlusion device inside the aorta. So you would uh, prevent blood from going into the distal extremities or lower body and increase the blood into the brain. However, again, it did not work very well. This is some of the PET scans showing this device. Again, not very helpful. So this was a big trial, the solitaire device versus the Mercy Retriever, the SWIFT trial, where they compared the Mercy, the first generation, with the second generation uh, stent, a retrievable stent device. And it showed that the solitaire actually had uh, better uh, results than the Mercy device. So the second generation, as you can see, device was working better for recanalization and for good uh, neurological outcomes in patients. Um, and then so this started being uh, used more often. And another trial came out, uh, again, using just the solitaire device. And again, very good outcomes. Revascularization rates were very high. So what we were showing is that mechanical thrombectomy was really working high. And what the takeaway, as you can see, is the hemorrhagic rate here uh, with the strength was only 4%, even lower than the intravenous TPA rate. So this was something good. We were getting good outcomes now. We were getting good revascularization, good neurological outcomes, and low bleeding rates. So this was a good trial that showed that the stent retrievers worked very well. Then in 2014, three big trials came out. One was the Mr. Clean trial, which was a, of course, uh, acronym for the multicenter clinical endovascular treatment in the Netherlands. Um, this one came out in uh, December 2014, and then uh, this was 233 patients for mechanical thrombectomy, um, and what they saw was they actually uh, having a very good outcomes in the thrombectomy uh, rate. In fact, the rate was so high and so good that um, it was decided it would be unethical to continue the uh, non-treatment arm of the trial or the uh, other treatment arm of the trial, the alteplase arm. So that was uh, stopped. Uh, because uh, the thrombectomy arm was showing such a uh, good um, uh, improvement in uh, neurological outcomes and no difference uh, and uh, improvement in mortality also. Um, then there was another escape trial, which was also looking for anterior circulation, small uh, strokes, again, with occlusion, and also um, showed that there was a favorable uh, neurological outcome, 53% getting better in the thrombectomy versus the control trial. And again, mortality was also very low. So again, what we saw was mechanical thrombectomy was working very well. And then a third trial also in 2014 was the EXTEND trial, which was an uh, Australian trial um, where they also did endovascular thrombectomy versus TPA. And again, this trial was also ended early because uh, it was showing that the thrombectomy patients were doing better at 71% compared to the control group of 40%. So because of this, it was decided to stop the trial um, uh, prematurely because, again, it was felt to be unethical to treat uh, the patients in the uh, inferior way. So uh, intraarterial recanalization, again, this is for major vessel occlusions. Um, in some patients, intravenous is not possible. These are some of the guidelines. If patients are more than 4.5 hours, you should not give intravenous TPA. If patients wake up with a stroke, so we don't know when the stroke happens, sometimes you don't, you're not, it's suggested not to give TPA. If patients have anticoagulant or recent surgeries, or major vessel occlusion. So again, the problem with intravenous TPA is there's a lot of restriction on which patients can get TPA. Now, I'm not going to go through this uh, anymore, really. I'm showing that you, again, the penumbra is a difference between, between blood flow and blood volume, and there is what was recoverable tissue. And this you can determine by different types of imaging. These are some of the devices. This is the initial uh, phase one or um, uh, first generation devices. This was the Mercy device. And then these are the, these are the stents or retrievable stents. So this is what the clot looks like once it's inside the stent. And this is the suction device, the penumbra um, device. So these are the different types. So these are the two, um, what we do now, either stent retrievers or uh, suction or sometimes a combination. Now let's go over some cases. So this is a 68-year-old male, diabetes, hypertensive, coronary artery disease. He had recent uh, coronary artery treatment in, uh, by a cardiologist to his LED. He went, underwent stenting and balloon angioplasty and then um, had uh, his platelets, he was on antiplatelets, but then suddenly developed a stroke and developed right-sided weakness with aphasia. And as you can see on the right side, there's a large clot in the middle cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery territory distally is not being perfused. Intravenous TPA was given, but no improvement. So here you have uh, intraarterial time. Uh, you wanna do, uh, here we did a penumbra device. We wanna get flow. We talk about flow is two, level one flow, level two flow, level three flow, three flow is what we want. 
And again, we will have to use time quickly. So uh, what are the information that you want to know? One, you, before you start, you want to make sure the patient doesn't have any bleeding already in the body. You want to see how size, the size of the infarct area. Is it a major vessel inclusion? And is there uh, penumbra or is there a reversible uh, tissue? You can do different imaging, contrast uh, CTs or non-contrast CTs, MRI with diffusion on CT angio and CT perfusion to determine which patients can be treated. Um, so depending on what a hospital has, you can decide what kind of treatment uh, you can do. Again, the risk you have to worry about is hemorrhage, major vessel inclusions. Again, CT angio is kind of better than MR angio. And I guess looking at the core, uh, diffusion weighted imaging is the best to see if there's a core, if there's a penumbra, and CT angio with perfusion is also uh, very good to determine if there's a penumbra and there's reversible uh, neurological uh, tissue in the brain. Again, this is a meta-analysis, again, using recanalization, different devices. And what we saw was that the um, newer devices, the stents worked very good, and the uh, vacuum suction devices also worked uh, pretty good compared to the first generation devices. And again, for neurological outcomes uh, as well. Here's another patient. So this is a patient with uh, aortic valve disease uh, and aortic valve regurgitation with, who's on Coumadin. Uh, had an INR of 2.5, but had developed right hemiparesis, uh, weakness of two out of five in the leg and zero out of five in the arm, and also having global aphasia. And as you can see, this is typical, those small vessels that go into the lenticular stride arteries are all blocked, all gone. Only the initial M1 is seen. The rest of the M1 is not seen, and there's all these vessels are gone, blocked by clot. The patient has a large core, so you can see this is the infarct core, and this is the penumbra. So there's a large penumbra which is still available for revascularization. So this patient was decided to treat, um, and we used a retraction stent. So you can see this is the clot inside the stent. So this is a retrievable stent. Uh, the stent is put into the clot, engage in the clot, and then you pull the clot out. And once you do, you start to get recanalization, and you start to see the vessels all open up again. And this is what it looks like uh, post, and you start from pre to post, you have much better vessels. And now you can see the full vessels are opened up. So the M1, M2, M3, and M4 branches are all opened. And you can see the CT later on, the patient doesn't have any signs of major vessel stroke. There's a small area of stroke here, but not the large MCA territory stroke. So patient made a full neurological recovery the next day. And we did the procedure within 28 minutes. Here's another case two, 41 year old male, stroke in sleep. So this patient is not eligible for IV TPA because they woke up with a stroke woke up with left-sided weakness, high stroke scale, uh, last seen well a long time ago, presented many hours, six and a half hours after. So again, not a candidate for IVTPA for two reasons. Uh, imaging was done and we saw a large uh, clot here. You can see this is the right-sided the right uh, MCA and the full right M1 is completely gone. M1, M2, M3, M4, all the branches are gone. And there's also clot or dissection happening here in the internal carotid artery. So a large, large stroke. And again, there is a large area of, uh, here's the actual uh, core infarct, but a large penumbra area. You can see the red is the penumbra area. So there was a lot of viable brain tissue, which was still uh, eligible uh, to be treated, and we could probably get some neurological recovery. So this patient was treated. Um, we got in uh, with a uh, stroke uh, strength retriever device, got it engaged within the clot. Once we got it inside, we were able to start from here where there's a blockage to here, it's all opened up. And you can see there's probably some residual atherosclerotic narrowing, which is probably the cause of this patient's uh, clotting. Uh, the probably flow was slowed here and they developed into a clot. But once we were able to engage the clot, you could see the CT showed no major signs of any focal infarct after uh, the procedure. Uh, patient seemed to do very well. Um, so they got upper limb recovered to four out of five and the lower limb, sorry, upper limb three out of five and lower limb four to five. And even 30 days, he improved afterwards. So the patient did uh, improve after this uh, large vessel clot. So some of the technical issues, sometimes uh, certain times that you can get high canalization rates, uh, true 60 to 90%. Sometimes uh, if it's calcified or old clots, difficult to get out or calcified uh, pieces that come off the heart are difficult to treat. Um, sometimes you have bifurcation clots. We have clots going in different vessels. Those are difficult to treat. Um, some patients have intracranial stenosis, and I include Pakistani Indians among this. Asians, they have higher rates. They have smaller brain vessels, smaller cardiac vessels, and they have more intracranial stenosis, more because of smoking, and the higher rates of smoking uh, correlate directly with intracranial stenosis. Um, 
Sometimes balloons can be used, but again, with torture authority, it's very difficult. And sometimes you have to use, you have to decide whether you're going to use general anesthesia versus local anesthesia for certain patients. And of course, if there's a stenosis or dissection, you have to be careful in treating those kind of patients. So these are some of the devices which are now being used. These are all the, what we call the stent retriever devices. Uh, this is by Stryker, and you can see they have different kinds of uh, nitinol cores, and these nitinols are shapeable and will go and directly engage into the clot, and then you can pull the clot out. Uh, this is the aspiration technique called the ABDAP technique, where you take an aspiration catheter, a larger catheter, put it in and get it right next to the clot, and then suck the clot up um, using a vacuum method. Um, this is uh, what's called a proximal occlusion. So you have a balloon here, they will occlude flow, so stop the flow here temporarily, arrest flow, and then suck. And then once they're here, they have the clot engaged, they will then pull the catheter down and get it uh, out and get the clot out. And you can get large clots, and I'll show you some pictures of some of the large clots. This was the ADAPT technique, which was done in uh, South Carolina. Uh, Imran Chaudhary, one of our Pakistani doctors, was also involved in Anand Siddiqui as well. So um, this was showing that you could get very fast, 28 minutes, you could get recanalization of the brain vessels after stroke and actually get good recanalization rates and patients did well. This is what the clot actually looks like. So this is, you can see a very large clot. This is measuring in millimeters here. So this is a very large clot um, which was taken out of the uh, vessels. Uh, this is what the clot catheter looks like, and you can even suction out catheter, even calcified clots can be taken out with this, uh, this technique. And this was done in 29 minutes, where we had a patient who had a large uh, blockage of the MCA, and you can see this global hypoperfusion, and afterwards, they had very good perfusion uh, once we were able to remove the clot. Again, this is uh, some of the pictures of some of the clots that we were able to aspirate. So again, within two minutes, uh, you've got aspiration done, and you can get these pieces of clot out of the vessels and then uh, get good circulation. You can see here, this is the clot actually right here. This is all clot inside and contrast around the clot and then a big volume of clot here. And we were able to pull those pieces of clot out. Another patient with us, we did aspiration within six minutes, we got the catheter up and we had the clot out and then good flow afterwards. And again, showing pieces of the clot and even some calcified clot. And these are what the wires and catheters which go in the brain look like. And within 30 seconds, you can get very good flow. And this is a difference, actually, this is a cost difference. The stent retrievers are a little bit more expensive, though the prices have gone down. These were the initial rates in the early 2000s, and these have gone down somewhat because there's so many more uh, device manufacturers. Um, and this was the suction rate. And you can see the suction catheter was a little bit cheaper, about half the price of the stent catheter. So the suction started to take over, uh, one, because of cost, and also because you could get larger clots out. And get better outcomes. So while we, so where would we stand now? So we use stent retrievers most of the time. Uh, if you can get patients within one hour, you'll get the best results. We sometimes still give some TPA, usually intravenously or even arterially, but now we give lower doses because we know that the more inter, the more TPA given, the higher rates of hemorrhage. So we're giving less and less of this TPA. We will pay, put the patients on heparin uh, initially, but lower doses than heparin. And what we're seeing is by decreasing the heparin dose, decreasing the TPA dose, decreasing the anticoagulants, um, you get a lower rate of intracranial hemorrhage. So the conclusions are IV, the problem with IV thrombolysis, while it's good, um, it doesn't always work well if the clot burden is high. Intraarterial works uh, better, especially mechanical intraarterial uh, thrombolysis. And sometimes you can do bridging therapy where you can give intravenous and then go for intraarterial therapy as the definitive therapy. And uh, that's the presentation. Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Asnan. Heather, now I will request uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Tanvir Zubairi if you have any to give the comments. Professor Tanvir Zubairi is also professor and teachers, senior teachers of the radiology, and he is with us. Professor Tanvir Zubairi. Assalamu alaikum. What a word. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Shahsab. What a wonderful talk he has uh, yes, given and, a, and, and an elaborate lecture he has given. And um, he has almost covered all of the aspects. And I must congratulate uh, him for his uh, uh, really very uh, good work they are performing. I've got a question uh, that uh, our scope of work recently in our uh, setup in Pakistan, after so long of uh, waiting, 
we just have been able to uh, introduce the TPA in a few centers only. Yeah. So okay. uh, what what a revolution we have seen uh, beyond this with this uh, catheterization and uh, uh, catheter techniques. It's amazing, and, it, and it's like uh, the game changer. So will it be sure. possible for uh, uh, the countries like us, or the or the like um, economies like us, which are uh, really uh, going down every with every passing day? So will we be able to like uh, introduce these uh, modalities in the near future in our country? Well, well with, with especially in Pakistan. Yes. Uh, People having uh, purchase power as well. Will it, will it be possible uh, the expertise transfer and other stuff? So I think um, I think uh, it's possible. Yes, and, and it requires. But usually, this um, Indonesia did this, and Indonesia, while they do have some oil, they're not still a, a very very rich country. Um, Indonesia uh, kind of had because Indonesia has the highest rate of stroke in the world. Um, and uh, one, because there are a lot of smokers, and two, they're Asians, they have smaller vessels. So the government decided that it was a uh, it was a crisis situation. So they actually got their doctors, they sent a lot of doctors to train in India. So they went, uh, they got their neurologists and uh, interventional radiologists and some of their uh, vascular surgeons to get trained in these techniques. Um, and they went and they got specialized training. And then um, they also uh, converted a lot of the cath labs. So even in Pakistan, you have lots of cath labs. So you, in a cath lab, you can do a stroke case. So as long as the cath lab is available and the operator is available, then the last uh, big hurdle is the equipment costs. And as you might have seen in the presentation, one of the treatments, um, while the stents are very expensive and may not be available for all patients, the suction uh, technique is cheaper. And uh, you can even use regular catheters as a suction. You don't have to use a specialized um, suction catheter. So you may not get a, as good a result without the specialized catheters. But um, if you do suction into the clot and just even using a simple syringe, and this is what we started initially, we started with just a simple 20 cc syringe or a 60 cc syringe attached to the catheter, we could get enough suction power to remove some of the clot. So I guess the answer to your question is yes, in a country like Pakistan, or even countries like Bangladesh, um, where there is uh, problems with uh, finances, um, these patients can be still treated. Uh, the keys uh, to treatment would be one, getting the patient in. So the one the country has to recognize that as soon as a patient has some problem with speech or problem with motor function or sensory function, they need to get to a place with a cath lab as soon as possible. And as soon as they get to that area, then they have to have people who are trained uh, to treat. Um, I know in Pakistan, some of the cardiologists are learning uh, to treat a uh, stroke. So you have cardiologists, you have vascular surgeons, interventional radiologists, and neurologists. So you have enough of people, as long as they're properly trained, um, it can be uh, it can be done at Boston. Oh, and actually, we did the first stroke. Uh, we did the first stroke clinic in 2014 in Lahore at um, Lahore General Hospital. We had two uh, neurointerventionists, myself and an Egyptian doctor. We were on call 24 seven, and we treated about uh, five patients successfully. And even one patient who came in comatose, a military officer who had a very devastating stroke, uh, vertebral basal stroke, and he was completely comatose, and we were able to actually treat him successfully. So can it be done in Pakistan? I think it can, yes. Okay, Dr. Professor Zubair Tanimiri, actually this is the need of the you people, like your teachers of teachers, teachers of uh, radiology, and uh, you have to train your uh, students for this one. This is not a new concept, any, anyhow. Uh, you all know that uh, if we cannot treat the hemiplegia, people can go for the uh, stroke. We, with the people go uh, suffer for the long time. And uh, another thing is very common should also, uh, PMA is there, Kazi Saab is there, and other people are there, that they should uh, request the uh, comment to open such centers for uh, more than one place, not only at the Lahore and other areas, ILGH. Uh, Professor Zabit, no, I think wherever you, as Dr. Bukhar, you have wherever you have a cath lab, you could get uh, as long as you get people trained, as you said, uh, as long as a cath lab is available, then the, the right equipment is there. Uh, you can treat patients uh, in a cath lab anywhere in Pakistan. Cath labs are all over the place in all the even smaller cities. Okay, uh, Professor Zubair Tanwiri, have you any other suggestion? Uh, I, mean, I had got another question regarding the sure, sure. Uh, 
you are one uh, you one you uh, yes, yes. Uh, are you centers uh, like focusing on the hemorrhage is when Sorry, your 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 yes, keeps on going on mute. Can you just repeat your question again? Your voice, your voice is breaking, uh, doctor. Uh, ask the question, uh, the bad again. Yeah, yeah, yes. I, I repeat. I repeat. I, I was just asking that there are some cases of um, um, brain hemorrhage, especially uh -huh. um, intraventricular bleeds. Do you have some intervention uh, uh, available for them as well? Some choice or yes. some like something yes. new. Yes. So for large intracerebral hemorrhages or intraventricular hemorrhages, we actually drill a hole. Uh, you, usually you require a surgeon um, or an interventionist who knows how to do um, uh, ventricular drainage. Um, and you drill a hole into the hemorrhage area or over the hemorrhage area. Then you put a catheter into the hemorrhage area and the TPA we talked about, you actually drip the TPA into the clot. And by uh, dripping the TPA directly into the clot, the clot starts to dissolve and the brain tissue can kind of reform around the clot. And so by getting the clot, uh, getting rid of the clot faster, you get better neurological uh, recovery for those patients. So yes, there is a uh, now uh, treatment for patients with large hemorrhage. Uh, but again, this is requires specialized centers, usually requires neurosurgeon and uh, requires uh, the right equipment. But uh, there is a treatment available, yes, for even hemorrhagic treatment. Dr. Burhan, Dr. Burhan is also a radiologist. He is son of Mia Rashid Saab and uh, in Watim Medical College. Dr. Burhan, you have commented that there are some centers in private center in Pakistan. Can you uh, uh, name them and uh, what? how much cost for this one? Can you, uh, Dr. Burhan? Ji, sir, sorry, I'm not uh, this kind of... Dr. Rashid, I am, uh, I am also a radiologist currently working Yes, at you are also uh, well trained from the KE. Yeah, uh, no, I'm uh, I'm trained from Alafan Hospital, Karachi, oh, yeah. and uh, we are doing this procedure at Alafan. A uh, few of our colleagues are also doing this procedure at NNCBD, and few of our uh, uh, a few of our colleagues are doing this procedure in Lahore at LGH. Okay, Dr. how Omer much cost, are, doing how much private Lahore, people are costing? How much cost uh, of uh, this one procedure? Uh, sir, uh, near about like uh, five to six lakh mostly, but uh, okay. I don't know the exact cost. This is the thing that a poor man cannot uh, afford. That is why such people at the government center like LJ, no doubt. Uh, yes, sir, this should be introduced at, uh, yes, from the government. Yes, we should request that such diseases are not only for the rich people, also the poor people are suffering with stroke. Dr. Rashid Saab, you are also a professor of physiology. Uh, you want to raise the question, ask the question? Uh, okay. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. It was an excellent awakening presentation. Uh, I just want to add what you were saying. The We should know the centers where this facility is available. I know uh, it was available in uh, where I am working, Ramar Medical Institute, Peshawar. The latest position, I do not know. Uh, but uh, I was to add that as many central office bearers of Pakistan Medical Association are here. I am also one of them. We at the level of Pakistan Medical Association should raise the issue with the government that uh, government should open these centers and we at the forum of PMA should regularly keep informing the people that where these facilities are available. Even if the doctors, we do not know that where in different cities this facility is available with payment or without payment. So a regular list should be circulated by the association of the doctors. This is I, I wanted to add. Okay, Rashid Saab, two crore. Actually, Hor ki aur ek center hai. Aur Karachi ka mujhe nahi pata. Abrahan ne bataya ke Aga Khan mein hai. So what I think PMA is also working on this. Now, see, who is our Any of you? Mulazim Sir, actually, I would like to say something. Mulazim Sir, thank you very much, Mulazim Sir. Actually, it was an excellent presentation by Dr. Hasnain Haider. I am an ENT surgeon, Dr. Haider, and actually, the the brain and the ear is very related and very close. So uh, one thing I must say, what the Dr. Rashid said, that we have facing a lot of problems for our uh, uh, pe uh, poor people in Pakistan for the facilities of the uh, uh, medical issues. 
but the pakistan medical association is uh, have been working uh, for, for a very long time for uh, 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 to to facilitate and to demand from the government to provide all the basic facilities now these are what you're talking about are the basic facilities uh, of the few uh, very very important or very serious diseases so uh, dr rashid is very correctly right that uh, we we should have to continue our demand to the government so that it uh, the government uh, and my request is to uh, uh, pressurize the government from other uh, uh, societies like the radiology societies like other societies so that the government uh, uh, will uh, will bond to uh, provide these uh, facilities uh, number one and the, the my question is uh, a basic question uh, dr hasnan that uh, 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 what what and when uh, a general practitioner or a junior can can advise a patient just go and have a ct scan or have a mri so what are the basic apart from the bony and the uh, tissues imaging uh, what are the criteria for the for the particularly for the uh, general practitioners so that uh, it is very costly in pakistan and uh, everywhere ct scan so uh, the 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 money should be uh, correctly uh, spent uh, otherwise the people say no uh, when the gp sent to the specialized uh, person he said no we we don't see the ct scan you go and take uh, mri so what are the criteria please tell us thank you very much yeah, so very important think, question yeah so i think a good radiologist um, even there is something called an aspect score so a patient who's having a stroke um, you can do the Alberta stroke scoring for non-contrast CTs. Uh, so even a non-contrast CT will help in certain cases of stroke. If you can give contrast, that will usually be better. Um, MRI, yes, uh, the imaging is uh, better to see stroke, but uh, any center that has CT and if they can give contrast, then you can get a very good study and you can actually see the stroke. Again, uh, the purpose is to, if you can treat the stroke. Uh, if you cannot treat the stroke, then imaging may not be the, the best uh, alternative at that point. But if you can treat the stroke, yes, then then it's a good idea to get uh, the imaging done. And uh, you, I'm sure some centers, they just don't want to do the CT because it's uh, sometimes a little bit more difficult to interpret um, stroke CT, especially non-contrast. But uh, it is a, a legitimate way to uh, treat uh, the patient and diagnose the patient initially and then determine, one, that's not hemorrhagic stroke, and two, it's more ischemic, and then treat the ischemic stroke. Okay, Bukhari Sahib. Bukhari Sahib, this is Dr. Khazi Wasif. May I okay. say Please something? Khazi Sahib. It was excellent presentation. Thank you very much. And coming back to the uh, uh, availability of the facilities for stroke management, especially in Karachi, the NICVD, National Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases, they have been advertising, uh, creating awareness among the people uh, that this facility is uh, available at NICVD. Uh, and they were very particular about the immediate, uh, you know, uh, arrival at the center. And the timing is very important within, uh, you know, uh, few hours, uh, the earlier the better, the first uh, and the second hour is the most important. And uh, I think uh, regarding about the cost of uh, man stroke management at an ICVD, they offer free services. Uh, that's what they have been educating, they, they've been advertising, and uh, they, their uh, cath labs uh, in the various centers of the uh, SIN, uh, because they have expanded and they have uh, provided, you know, satellite clinics uh, in Karachi and uh, in the interior of Sin. So they, they have, uh, you know, uh, created a lot of awareness among the uh, poor people. They, they are there. So I think uh, what we need is to, you know, uh, make the people know that this facility awareness. is awareness. and make the people aware about it. And thank you very much. It was excellent. And what, what we need is uh, we need to have much more centers like other centers also who they do. They have 
uh, cath labs, they can always, you know, get the trained people there and uh, the stroke management can be done there. Thank you very much, Imulazim Sahib, for uh, this excellent... Thank you, Professor Kari, Dr. Kari Sahib. Uh, Dr. Abu Bakr Sadiq, you want to something? You have commented. Uh, Ji, sir. Yes, thank sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Ji, sir. Thank you so much, sir. You have uh, uh, arranged this uh, wonderful piece of talk. I am Dr. Abu Bakr Sadiq. I am a consultant interventional neurologist, also stroke and vascular neurologist fellowship from USA. Good, good, good. good. I, uh, I, am, I have started my work in a services hospital. Then I went to general hospital for neuro intervention. Then I did my fellowship. I am doing uh, stroke and uh, general neurology in private sector from seven years. Uh, my point is that the most important thing in strokes, uh, when we talk about the stroke, stroke is just a symptom. Uh, behind mm -hmm. this, uh, the na name stroke, there is a, a lot of things are there, just but some patients have like urinary infarct, some hemorrhagic, some this and that. First of all, we need to develop the state of the art stroke centers where the triaging of the patient must be done. Okay, which patient uh, needs what treatment in the particular area? And we, we should continue our struggle to develop the stroke centers in every teaching hospital, particularly, where we should have the particular uh, personnel who are uh, uh, very adept in treating the stroke in every aspect. And then the part of this neuro intervention uh, is, uh, I, I think this is not far for away in Pakistan, that uh, the, there will be, inshallah, every center doing the neuro intervention. And uh, you, the people like you are doing a lot of work and everyone is now uh, making awareness among the people. <clears throat> Another important thing is I, I, I have to say that this is not the thing about the poor and the rich. Every patient has the right to be treated. You know, as far as stroke is concerned, even the people who are uh, uh, rich and have a lot of money are not able to get the proper treatment. If we have the arrangements to give the treatment to the rich people, then people uh, who are not uh, affording this treatment will also be able to get the treatment. And uh, so with, uh, my point now uh, in conclusion is this, we should uh, work about the development of the stroke center to give treatment to every patient with the stroke and then inshallah things will be better. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think a uh, lot of discussions has been done in the, this webinar, PMA and other, other our collaboratives. We are working this. Oh, not only to give the new treatments, new managements, also to raise our voice on, through this webinar. We also write uh, articles on this and we submit to the uh, different newspapers about these webinars. Hopefully, now I will request Professor Sarma Kundi uh, to conclude today's sessions uh, with a vote of thanks. Professor Sarma Kundi, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Malazam Saab. It was a beautiful talk by Sayyid Hasnain Haider Shah Saab. I thank you on behalf of PMA Sayyid Saab because it was really, really enlightening. And I am so, it's so, uh, I'm so happy to hear from Dr. Abu Bakr that there are many people working in this area in Pakistan. We found out in Karachi, there is the NICVID and in Lahore, there is LGH. Hospital, what does the LGH hospital stand for? Can anybody enlighten me, please? Lahore General Hospital, Lahore General Hospital. Okay, Lahore General Hospital. In Peshawar, Dr. Rashid told us it is there in RMI. I know probably they have it in Shifa International in Islamabad, but I don't know about other, the rest of the government sector hospital. When we upload this webinar, Dr. Mulazam Saab, I think we should do our homework and write it well, in that shall, webinar uh, or we'll express it, it, we also write wherever it is this. available because it's very mandatory for a layman to know where they can reach and they should reach there within half an hour or one hour so that their lives is... I again thank everyone on behalf of PMA, on behalf of Women Medical College, Azad Jammu Kashmir Medical College, the PPS and the PAP, which is the Physiological Society and the Pathological Society and the South Asian Physiological Society. Have a blessed Sunday and stay safe. Thank you so much. Pakistan's in the uh, bath. Thank you so much. Dr. Abu Bakr, can you give uh, your contact number so we can update uh, before uh, where where centers are there? Dr. Kazi Seb has told something. Dr. Sajad Kaiser has told something. Uh, may, I, uh, may I add something? Can you hear me? Professor Abu Bakr, can you uh, give uh, us your number so that... Uh, we can contact you. Uh, yes, yes. yes sir. I, 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 I sent my number my, on my chat. My number, if you have... My number is 0300-8414-743. 0300-8414-743. 
आपका आ नहीं रहा अभी एट आ गया आपका यस वी कैन हियर यू आई थिंक देयर वाज समबडी टॉकिंग एंड दे वांटेड टू गिव एन इनपुट यस दिस इज मी डॉक्टर ताहिरा निश्तर आई एम द चेयर पर्सन डॉक्टर ताहिरा क्या हाल है आपका ओके थैंक यू सो मच जी शुक्रिया uh i am dr tahira nishtar i'm sorry i joined late but uh, uh i heard the discussion and uh, i think it's a wonderful activity that you have uh, organized i just wanted to add i'm at the moment heading the radiology department at leading hospital uh, we've got a full dedicated setup of uh, interventional radiology uh, the first of its kind in a public sector in uh, kpk and uh, uh, i just wanted to add that uh, we ourselves are working towards uh, uh, neuro intervention um, uh, prospects but uh, at the same time uh, uh, in liberating hospital and in hyderabad medical complex uh, stroke thrombolysis is being carried out uh, is an activity which has started a few months ago and it is free of cost under the umbrella of the uh, uh, initially they were on donation but now it's under the umbrella of the sehat card uh so this is something which i wanted to add thank you so much my dear really great thank you so much yeah. allah uh, bless you tara allah thank hafiz you. inshallah we will uh, meet next ma uh, next uh, sunday on a uh, important topic of monkey pox inshallah okay thank you and thank you dr hasan once again we thank you sure for your thank time you thank you happy to help Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz, everyone. Allah Hafiz, Allah Hafiz, Allah Hafiz.